Sometimes it's tough being a tough guy. For aquatic mega predators, all those slashing jaws and razor edge teeth may not be enough to cut it, especially in a world that is changing as fast as ours is. Even slight changes in climate, food supply, or water salinity can wreak havoc on wildlife. And predator populations are especially vulnerable. All around the world, many mega predators of the depths and the shallows are declining, both in health and numbers. My name is Mike Heithouse, and as an ecologist, I travel the globe to find out what makes these predators tick and how important they are for keeping ecosystems healthy. And for answers, you can say I dive right in. One of the most amazing and threatened places I've worked is the coastal Everglades, where the Gulf of Mexico meets a river swimming and crawling with predators, Shark River. This remote part of the Everglades is often overlooked, but is hugely important. And here our team from Florida International University finds plenty more than sharks in Shark River. The cool thing here is that we've got so many big predators mixing in one spot. Just right here, we're gonna see bull sharks, we're gonna see alligators up to maybe 10 feet long, and you might see 12 or 13 foot crocs in the same spot as bull sharks and alligators. But the Everglades has changed a lot in the last 100 years. People have dug canals to drain huge areas, and much of the water that used to flow to the coastal Everglades doesn't anymore. Right now, though, we're in the middle of a huge restoration effort to get the water flowing again. That means more changes are in store for the coastal Everglades, and it's one of the reasons that we need to understand how alligators, sharks, and the other animals that live here respond to the flow of fresh water, so we can predict what will happen. Now the other thing that's going on is that sea levels are rising, and that means that salt water is gonna be going farther and farther upstream. What's that gonna mean for alligators and the other animals here? That's one of the things we're trying to find out. To help predict what a changing landscape might mean for predators, like gators, we need to know where they're prowling for food and exactly what they're finding to eat. Um, I think we're going to start up in Tarpon Bay, maybe, because the salinities will be good there. Sounds good. Two snares ready to go. All right, let's make it happen. Just add alligator. <laughs> but we can't add alligator until nightfall. That's when our spotlight catches the gleam of alligator eyes. I see it. Control, reverse, reverse! First we tag. Five, two, four, nine, two. Way. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And record measurements. 1.8. Now it's safe to get a look at our alligator from the inside yep. out. All right, pal, you need to calm down. Pumping its stomach requires <laughs> extreme caution and some high-tech tools. Oh, hello. Like PVC pipe from the local hardware store. Whatever it takes to keep this gator's snout from snapping shut. Ooh. <laughs> hello, sir. Kids, don't try this at home. Grown-ups, not you either. That good or one more? That's good. Perfecto. Jump. Do you feel anything? Oh no, I'm past the neck, I'm past. Adam fills the alligator's stomach with water. Next, we push on the stomach to see what our alligator had for lunch. We only do this because knowing what alligators eat is critical for protecting them. 
and it also tells us how important they are for maintaining a healthy ecosystem. They tell you I got that hair. Oh, oh. oh. look at that. Sweet mammal. Oh, we got some bits and pieces. Not sure what it is, but there are some bits and pieces. Let's keep it up. I think he's got got something good to show us. Go a little bit further back on his body. Oh, oh no! 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 <laughs> no! It's in my underpants! It's in my underpants! It's like panning for gold. So in their diet, we found that they're not eating really large animals all of the time. Sometimes they're eating fish that are only this big. Um, sometimes they're eating really small blue crabs or they're eating shrimp or they're eating crayfish, things that you wouldn't expect a large carnivore to eat. Um, and we've also found that not all alligators are carnivores all of the time. I found a lot of fruit in their diet, specifically pond apples, some of them eating up to four or five or six pond apples at a time. Uh, well, it suggests that alligators are more complex than we originally thought. Now we know these top predators can feed pretty far down the food chain. Yeah, you might want more. But we still need to determine where they grab a meal. And this transmitter will help us do it. There she is, perfect. All right, looking good. Excellent. Each transmitter pulses a unique code. As our alligator moves through the Shark River, listening stations detect its presence. We have dozens of these stations throughout the habitat that record the identity of each predator and the time it swam by. One of the things that really amazed us is that it seems a few intrepid alligators are heading to the ocean in search of crabs. Very tricky for them because their bodies can't handle that level of salt for long. We call these guys commuters because they head home to fresher water to purge salt from their systems before making another trip toward the ocean. It turns out alligators aren't the only commuters swimming in unexpected waters. Oh, little shark. Well, we've got a little bull shark here. And this is what we tend to find up here. Okay, it's uh, 55. We'd like to be able to predict how bull sharks adjust to their environment because as the environment changes, so too does their habitat use, their behavior, which affects the rest of the food web. And as restoration or climate change continues, that will in turn adjust where the bull sharks are found and what they're doing. Definitely less than one year old. The blood samples have chemical markers called stable isotopes. Here, Pat, between the pec fins. Which tell us what these guys have been eating. Like the gators, these guys get a transmitter. This tells us where they might be hunting. Yeah, there we go. Release condition, good. Excellent, guys. Five sharks, that's the most we've ever had on one long line. And the day is still young. Now, one of the really neat things we found is that these sharks are individuals. It's not just a shark as a shark. Some of the sharks spend maybe five years here in the Everglades and probably don't ever leave. Others are kind of the commuters. They're going down to the ocean, feeding, and then they're coming way back up here upstream. And there they deposit these nutrients from the ocean and maybe are stimulating a lot of the growth that we see. So these commuters, both shark and alligator, are shaping their environment just as their environment is shaping them. And it starts from day one, because as it turns out, Shark River is also a shark nursery. Juveniles are born here, up to 10 at a time. But something is forcing many of them to remain upstream where food may be in short supply. Not the best thing for a predator in training. So we're heading to the mouth of the river to find out what that something could be. and we're either stuck on the bottom or we have something big. The lemon. These lemon sharks love to eat small sharks. So if you're a baby bull shark, this is not what you want to see. 
And if you're a scientist, you want to be careful too. Well, lemon sharks are probably about the hardest species to handle. Uh, not only do they have very sharp teeth and they're big predators, six, seven, eight feet fairly frequently, but they're very flexible. So where most sharks are fairly thick and can't really turn around, lemon sharks can fold in half. And so, so they're a species you have to be especially careful of when you're handling. We do everything we can to minimize danger, including turning the shark onto its back, where it slips into a trance-like state. Tonic immobility. Tonic oh, immobility is an involuntary reflex, kind of natural paralysis, but it doesn't always last long. So we have to work quickly before we run out of time. 2.15. 208. And we don't have much time to work. 215. But ultimately, it's the sharks that may be running out of time. Sharks are disappearing around the world. Some populations may be down 80 to 90 percent. And yeah, we have to take some risks when we go out and work with them, but understanding their importance in the ecosystems is absolutely critical, so we have to take those risks. The great apex predators of the world's waters are in trouble. And when things go wrong for them, it can be trouble for other creatures too. Here in the coastal Everglades, a flood of man-made change is coming. And we know there will be some winners and some losers. We're doing everything we can to understand and help protect the wildlife here. We want to be sure there will always be predators in Shark River. <laughs>